Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to allow me to spend more time than I'd ever get on the radio with interesting people. Clive Myrie, welcome. It's good to see you. Good to be here. It's good to see you and already that voice. Those, that, that, that rich, those rich, dulcet tones. I felt I was back in the mastermind chair for oh, a moment. Oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> I've scared you already. You have terrified me to the core. <laughs> but, of course, we, we mentioned the fact that you've got so many plates spinning. We've already, we're already alluding to that. And now mm. you add memoirist to, to the list with everything is everything, a memoir of love, hate, and hope. Um, we'll, we'll dive in at the beginning and, and thread through things that you do write about in the book, things that you don't, and, and, and really a, a life... A life well lived and it begins in well in many ways it begins in Jamaica doesn't it even though your life began in Bolton yeah um, absolutely because my parents are Windrush generation uh, immigrants um, although not immigrants under the strict rules of the British Nationality Act 1948 in fact they are equal citizens along with everybody else mm. first time this had been done since the Romans any empire making everyone equal citizens and that needs to be remembered um, so they traveled from Jamaica. Uh, my mum by plane, my dad by ship, got to the UK and they wanted to build uh, a new and prosperous life for themselves and their family in the mother country. This mythical sort of mm. amazing land where the queen was and they drank tea in China cups and, you know, it was all about decency and fair play and cricket and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in the West Indies we play cricket slightly differently <laughs> in those days not so much now actually um, it has to be said um, there are lots of similarities between the English cricket team now and yes. the way the West Indies played in the in the 80s and 90s um, but they moved to this country you know like so many immigrants do with the hope that they will, can build a better life and uh, and that is the beginning of my story um, growing up in Lancashire in the, this little mill town called Bolton and I think your dad acclimatized less successfully than your yeah, mum. Yeah, he, he had more difficulty, I think. Mum saw it as an opportunity to possibly be a teacher, mm. and that's what she was doing in Jamaica, and she hoped to take that, uh, that experience with her to the UK, but her qualifications weren't deemed to be good enough, so she wasn't able to do that. What does that um, mean, the qualifications weren't deemed to be good enough? Uh, they had a particular... Um, set of qualifications that they claimed um, you had to get in this country. Right. Um, it's it's the classic Andrea Levy story from from Small Island. Mm. You know, you're a teacher in another part of the empire. You're told you're an equal citizen. You're told that uh, you are as equal to anyone else, but actually, um, for whatever reason. You're not equal. Some, that, some animals are more player. equal than others. Yeah, yeah. That played itself out in in the uh, in that particular situation concerning my my parents' qualification, my mum's qualification to so, be a teacher. So, so, yeah. so you, you mentioned Andrea Levy, and and it is it's a it's I mean in, in, it's a tale of scales falling very quickly from eyes in many ways, isn't mm. it? When when people yeah. arrive here, yeah. How, how quickly did they fall from your parents' eyes? My mum thought there would be difficulties when it came to teaching anyway. Mm. Um, so she was sort of prepared, actually. And she was a brilliant seamstress in Jamaica. Um, and she knew that that was something she could fall back on. Um, she did tell herself that if the qualifications weren't good enough, she could do night classes and it would be okay. But then she fell pregnant with me. Okay. So that made that really difficult. So she basically shelved that idea. For my father, um, and for lots of other Windrush Generation um, people actually um, the scales fell away pretty pretty quickly on arrival um, you've just got to look up in the heavens and look at all the clouds mm. and then you know snow arrives at some point <laughs> and this ain't the Caribbean <laughs> you know um, that that uh, the, the the temperature and the weather made made things fall away quickly but you know we've got to remember that just like apartheid South Africa just like the segregated states of the United States in the 50s and 60s, it was legal for employers to say, no, you cannot have that job because you're black. Mm. It was legal for people to say, yo, you can't have a room in my boarding house because you're black. Um, there was discrimination that the TUC fully backed mm. when it came to employment. Um, so that helped the scales fall away from people's eyes. And then, you know, the whole idea that no blacks... No Irish, no dogs. 
not allowed into a pub because you're black. Um, you're going to be abused in the street because you're black. That didn't tie in and marry in with this idea of the mother country, no. this land where you're an equal citizen, this land where of opportunity. That didn't marry up. And and for a lot of for a lot of people who move from the Caribbean, uh, having been told they were citizens, the law was changed to make them citizens. Um, it was it was a rude awakening and very difficult. I, I think people listening will will already be noting that your reputation for remaining scrupulously above the fray <laughs> is is not present in this in this mm. book. In in it, that there's anger there, and yeah. and and you've said that although the original conceit for everything is everything was a a memoir charting how the country has changed because you're. The two coronations, in some ways, bookend your life yeah. almost. It, yeah. it, it turned pretty quickly into, I think you've described it as a love letter to the Windrush generation. It, it, yeah. it's, it's an empathy. It's a love, empathy type of love, isn't it? It's a. I think I think so. Sort of, you know, going through, finding out fully by talking at length to my parents. My dad's 94, my mum is 86. And trying to tease out of them what it was like when they first arrived. You know, and it's I, I say in the book, it's a little bit like uh, First World War veterans mm. not wanting to talk about the war. You know, it's difficult to get them to relate to me, you know, ex the experiences they had when it comes to racism. And a lot of it I got from aunties, I got from my older uh, siblings who'd spoken to their to our parents about about the problems they faced in the past. And I had to sort of piece things together. My mum would say, oh, well, you know, I'm sure it was nothing. I'm sure they didn't mean it. You know, one of the chapters is called Take This Letter to the Priest. Mm. And it's where it's where my mum, who was a teacher, as I say, in Jamaica, um, she worked at a school affiliated to the local Catholic church, as so she was Catholic. And she got a letter of introduction from the priest to say, take this letter to the priest in Lancashire and, you know, get him... Um, to accept you into his flock, to worship every, every, every mass, and she took the letter to this priest. And the church was within five minutes walking distance of where my mum lived at the time. Um, I'd just been born. Uh, no, I hadn't been born actually. I hadn't been born. Um, and um, she took the letter of introduction, fully expecting this priest to say, "You're a fellow traveller, mm. fellow Catholic. It's great to see you." come on in and he read the letter and he said well I'm sorry I can't I can't accommodate you here at this church because your address falls outside the diocese and it was five minutes away <laughs> and to get to the church that was in the diocese was a good two or three bus ride away yeah um, now my mum to this day to this day will not say it was racism that the priest was not racist because she cannot conceive of a priest being racist, oh. um, and uh, and that's that that's incredible. I think um, when she told me the story, I only found out when I was getting married because I thought I was I was brought up as an Anglican, so I thought marrying a Catholic, Catherine is Catholic, that I'd have to convert mm. um, or get <laughs> the local bishop to write some special letter. <laughs> and um, my mum said, I was telling my mum about this, and she said, No, you're actually Catholic. You were baptized Catholic because I'm Catholic. It's only because the Church of England took us in, not far from our home, that you were brought up an Anglican. So that's when I found out, and uh, it's quite quite incredible story. But it's fatalism, and and also protecting herself from the pain of acknowledging the racism, or, or just just her faith, thinking that a priest can't be a bad person. I th I th I think I think it's protecting herself as yeah. well. You know this this understanding or coming to the realization that that the church is you know can be as racist and horrible as as any other institution um you know is something that would be difficult for a god-fearing person to to understand and accept and i make it clear in the book in that chapter i i sort of put in there the experience that I had making a panorama looking mm -hmm. at whether or not the church of england was racist to get across the fact that yeah you can have a clergy that um, that rewrote the Bible <laughs> um, in order to justify slavery. Yes, you know that uh, that these things these things happen. So yes, I think I think you're right. It's a, a level of self protection um, and not wanting to acknowledge that this that this this institution can be unwelcoming to people just like her. A, a, a very happy home. 
though. I yeah. mean, a really yeah. you t- tight, tight knit. Yeah, is... yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know the frustrations of immigrant life for my father would come out from time to time, particularly with my two older half brothers. Um, Who'd stayed in Jamaica originally. Yeah, they, they, so they were in Jamaica. Mm. Um, and my older sister were in Jamaica when my parents came over uh, on their own. Um, and in fact, the majority of Windrush Generation families uh, were broken up. Mm. Um, I think it's, it's some weird statistic. Like I think it's like 6,000 kids came over with their parents, but 600,000 were left behind. Gosh. It's, it's, the disparity is huge. Right. And, um, and so, you know, they were growing up with my older brothers and, and, uh, and older sister. They were growing up with grandparents. They were, my, my older brothers were early teens, in their early teens when they came over. You know, they had more of a carefree life in Jamaica. Mm. So suddenly to come to this land where they were speaking Jamaican patois in school, they didn't know who the Bay City Rollers were and all <laughs> that kind of stuff, who the latest sports stars were, you know, they felt a level of alienation. And I think the strictures of living under uh, the same roof as my father, who expected a certain behavior, yeah. um, you know, would have been really hard. And I didn't appreciate, James, I didn't appreciate how hard it was for them until I came to write the book. And oh, I, really? I, I regret that. Yeah, I regret that um, because I didn't understand the arguments and the shouting and the Barneys and the slam doors. Um, I, you know, I just saw that as part of life, but I didn't fully understand what was going on. And now I understand it was it was because they were having so much trouble fitting into this new life um, that uh, that had been thrust upon them. And into which you were born, which obviously yeah. gives a, a completely different proposition. Although you were pa- painfully shy, you threw up on your first day <laughs> of primary school. <laughs> my God, I thought, right, I'm going to write this book. What's my earliest memory? And my earliest memory is throwing up at primary school. <laughs> um, you know, this 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 liquidy, lumpy stuff just going everywhere. Um, and I said, that's my earliest memory, Mum, isn't it? And she said, no. Uh, she said, y- yes, it is your earliest memory, but I remember you um, obviously giving birth and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But when you were at preschool, you were mute. I said, really? She said, yeah, for weeks you would not talk in school. And I couldn't understand this. Um, and she said she was called in by the teacher who said, I'm really worried about your son. He's not communicating in class at all. Uh, And we think he should see a child psychologist. And my mum, having been a teacher in Jamaica, she would deal with all kinds of kids, Mm. the shy ones, the extroverts, the introverts, the sporty ones, all all manner of kids. And she understood and she said, look, he's just shy. You know, he's an only child. I was then at that stage. He's an only child. Um, And uh, he only talks with me at home. Um, Not even his dad because his dad's out at work. And by the time his dad gets in, He's, a, he's in, tucked up in bed. So it's just a shock for him to be in this new environment. So give him a bit of time. But of course, subsequently, you, you, you realize that, you know, a, a number of black kids were actually put into remedial classes and were um, separated from the rest of the, 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 the school in terms of classes and education if they showed anything that was different from the norm. Right. Um, and Steve McQueen's Small Axe series, you know, chronicles one episode of mm. that. Um, so I, w- I had a lucky escape because yes, of course. Uh, three or few, few weeks later, I started talking. <laughs> and the first thing that came out of my mouth was, my mum and dad have lions and tigers in the house. <laughs> and the t- teacher was like, oh my God, he really is. We really do need to get the child. He's yes. talking about lions and tigers running around the front room and blah, blah, blah. And my mum came in, had to hauled in again. And um, and she said, no. She burst out laughing. She said, it's the giant little ornaments that oh. I've got on the mantelpiece. The lions and the tigers, we've got lots of them. Um, and that's what he's talking about. But I was, I was incredibly shy, and I put it down to, I put it down to being an only child for you know the first few years of my life, Just not knowing what own. to do, not knowing how to interact. Exactly, and, exactly. I and, think that was part of it. And, and you, you, you were talking then by the time you got to junior school, but you were still shy. Were you? A, were you? A, I, I sense you were a very attentive student. Yeah, I was. I was pretty, pretty, pretty good at school. Um, and, did you like uh, it? Yeah, I did. I did. I liked learning things. Mm. I liked picking stuff up. I liked finding out about things. I was very um, inquisitive 
I think, as a kid. Um, and our parents, my mum and dad, would watch the 10 o'clock news religiously. Bongs, ITV, BBC, too poncy, too posh, <laughs> alienating, alienating. Still very clipped. Uh, Accent still very, very clipped. Sort of, yeah. Absolutely. Old Howard Kendall and so on. Um, you know, great broadcasters, sure. but not, not my parents' cup of tea. So we always watched ITV. And I grew up with, you know, Gordon Honeycomb, original Bose and Kay, and yes. Alistair Burnett, and these, these, these guys, um, mainly guys. Um, it has to be said um, and I just sort of had individual windows on these on this world beyond the mill town of, of, of Bolton and um, and one guy I loved watching was 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 Alan Wicker mm. um, and his travelogue um, sort of series called Wicker's World where he'd be in Japan one week and you know Haiti the next and South Africa and America and and stuff and I just I'd be sitting there glued to the box watching this stuff thinking wow there is a whole world out there that I'd love to love to um, explore and I had a paper round at the same time so I'd be reading about a lot of these stories too so I was very inquisitive as a kid and wanted to sort of you know absorb like a sponge as much info as I as I could about the world around me were you conscious of having roots outside Bolton was that was that yes I was time? yes I was absolutely absolutely because um, you know I would we would accompany my mum every now and again down to the post office where she'd get a little sort of box uh, and put things in for the relatives mm. somewhere off beyond the sea <laughs> and you know one of those little aerogram sort of envelopes with a little blue plane on um, so I was aware there's stuff going on somewhere else um, and you know a grandmother somewhere else and and relatives and cousins somewhere else um, and then you know at some point you understand that you know my parents are immigrants they've come from this other place and they're now trying to make a new life here but they've left the life behind mm. um, and they're trying to keep a connection with that that life um, and and maintain who they are even in a new land and obviously with your mum's background the, the, the education taken very seriously were, very they, were, were there books in the house was, yeah. I mean, do, yeah absolutely and you know if you didn't do well in school if, if you were playing up if the teachers were unhappy then you know parents knew about it absolutely and they would go in on parents day and sports days and all that kind of stuff very very active in and trying to in trying to bring to fruition the whole point of them getting on the plane and getting course, on the boat in the first place. Which was for you as which, much as for them or more. Absolutely. Think, yeah. Absolutely. It was it was for a future um, for for their whole family. Um, that's what it was about. So you you developed the journalistic ambition quite young. I I, I mean, it, it, so did I. But my dad was a journalist, so it was hardly yeah. surprising. Everyone kind of was. It, it was quite a, an odd ambition for a nine ten year old lad in Bolton to. Yeah, it was a bit odd develop. actually. It was a bit odd because you know th there was no. Um, there was no legacy of that in our family. Um, although, you know, in, a, a sense of curiosity yes. and inquisitiveness would have been there for my mother as a teacher and wanting to learn new things and to impart that knowledge to other people, um, which is basically what journalists do, tell stories. Um, and uh, not, not an obvious job for a shy lad. But for a shy kid, yeah, yeah, not, not obvious. But at the same, but at the same time, uh, you know, having seen someone on TV hmm. do the kind of thing that I thought I might want to do, then, you know, I suppose that on a very sort of deep subconscious level helped overcome the shyness because you can't be shy and be on the TV. No. Um, and, uh, and so, and I suppose Bolton being, you know, northern Milltown, um, uh, in the northwest, you know, it's not part of any major hub. It's about 13, 14 miles from Manchester and a big scene going on there. But I suppose it was this sort of quite sort of small little community and, you know, uh, opportunities to sort of see beyond that community uh, came mm. through television and newspapers and so on. And that piques one's curiosity as well. And uh, but it was it was seeing it was seeing Alan run around the world thinking I want to run around the world yeah. and then seeing Trevor McDonald someone who looked like me making me realize God I could do that too it is possible Alan of course you know 
upper middle cl- sure. middle, middle class, um, you know, public school, all that kind of stuff. Spoke proper. Um, so yeah, so Trevor made it seem to me as if it might be possible to do it. So there you go. And and then off to grammar school, Haywood Grammar School. You, yeah. You, did what? What else did you do? Did you were you playing cricket a lot? Yeah. Where was yeah. It? Did a lot of sport. Yeah. Did a lot of sport. Played cricket. Wasn't that good at cricket? But I played a lot of football and rugby actually. Played yeah. A lot of rugby, and I played for the school um, at, at uh, tennis as well. Um, so I was very very sporty, gangly, um, young young guy. But Popular. I, lots uh, of friends. Yeah, I did actually have lots of friends. I had lots of friends. Um, I think partly because I was sporty. Yes, of course. So, so people would sort of, you know, be happy to have me in their football team. Yeah. Um, I was nippy, a nippy winger, uh, and uh, and that was that was great. Um, so I enjoyed that side of things, and I loved music as well. And I was really lucky that we went to a school where there was a big emphasis on on um, on uh, classical music. Um, so there was a school band, there was a wind orchestra, there was a full orchestra. We made a record, we would tour, we went abroad. Um, so I had lots of interests um, that were outside um, this idea of what I came to know as journalism. And, and deputy, head, deputy head boy? A de- de- deputy head boy, not head boy. No, why not? De- no, I, what happened? I really, I, the vote was rigged, I reckon. <laughs> I reckon it was I was done over, <laughs> and, and, and then after O levels to sixth form college in Bolton. Yeah. I think. Uh, no, uh, that... Yes, no, I did did O levels, and actually it became Haywood Grammar became a, um, oh, okay. a sixth form college right, the year after I left. Actually, so yeah. And so I've got a sense already that you knew that you were not going to be staying in Bolton all your life. No. And and how does that translate? And you've already got an ambition. Um, I think mum and dad wanted you to be a lawyer, which is why you ended up studying law at yeah. university. But yeah. so, 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 I mean, you, you knew you were getting out of town. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, there was a whole wide world out there that I'd seen on TV and I'd read about in newspapers. And I wanted to explore it, wanted to to, uh, to get to know it. So mum, mum um, and dad imbued you with a sense, or mum in particular, I think, imbued you with a sense that... Of, of not knowing your place or that you were capable of doing mm. whatever you wanted yeah. to do there was no, no. sort of um, yeah, there was no wing, barrier wing clipping no absolutely not education is your key to everything um you know and and you know figures from mandela to blair would make that clear education education yes. education um and and that is that is your key to to a, a, a fulfilled life um, so yeah, you know, it, it, it was, it was university was a given, um, college was a given, good A levels were a given. You just had to achieve it and get it done to achieve what you wanted in life. So, so, and my mother in particular was very, very good at instilling why that was so, mm. you know, to survive in this world, particularly being a person, uh, and people of color. Because you have to be better. Yeah. Yeah. Simply put, absolutely. Simply put, you know, you you can't you can't model along like some. Mm. You've got to you've got to demonstrate uh, a capacity for, frankly, for excellence. Yes. Um, you know, whether one has achieved that or not, that is the mindset that you've got to have um, if you're a person of color. Um, no question. So you get to Sussex, first yeah. time away from home. Was that a wrench? Was it difficult? Or were you, did no, you take it in your stride? It. No, Couldn't no, wait. Absolutely loved it. Absolutely. <laughs> Lovely loved part of the it. world as well. Quite different from Bolton. Yeah, very, yes. very different from Bolton. <laughs> Bit greener than Bolton. <laughs> it's not greener. Um, and uh, the campus was set in these beautiful grounds um, in Falmer, little village just outside Brighton. And it was it was just it was everything that I imagined university life to be from watching you know TV programs. Oh, lovely! You know, and you um, threw yourself into and it. And I just with threw, I absolutely yeah I absolutely loved it. It was I think I think the fact that it was a campus, you know, set in lovely grounds helped a lot actually. So mm. it didn't look like you know Bolton. Mm. Um, it wasn't a campus spread around you know buildings within a town centre. It wasn't Manchester or. 
or yeah. you know that kind of thing. Um, it's self-contained, so it's very isn't it? It's, it's yes, it is. It's self-contained. It's one of the first universities built um, in the 60s after that sort of opening up of, of education um, at the end of the war. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it was modeled on the American major and mm. minor system. So I studied law as my major, but I did American literature as, as a minor. And that meant that I could write and, and read and, you know. And you started cutting cases. cutting your journalistic teeth now. You started yeah, doing yeah, yeah. I started, bits and bobs. Uh, started doing stuff at Radio Falmer, which was the college campus uh, radio station um, as a very, very brilliant DJ. <laughs> Not <laughs> spinning, spinning the platters that matter. Um, and then, and yeah, and then doing, um, uh, there was an outreach program. Uh, that linked up BBC Radio, I think it was Radio Brighton then, not Radio Sussex. Uh, maybe I may have got that wrong, maybe it's the other way around. But anyway, the, the BBC local radio station um, linked up with the university. So there was a way of doing stuff for, for the BBC, and that's how I got to know the BBC a little bit. And, and you'd already decided that broadcast you favored broadcasting over writing over because i know you wrote yeah. some articles as well didn't yes you? But, i did but, but, i did including for black beauty and hair black magazine. beauty and hair magazine yeah not, not an obvious no no notch on your cv but, <laughs> but i don't know you i don't know if you remember this but um marie claire yes was huge as it still is i think but it was huge in the um 90s 90s and early noughties, mm. I think, for a lot of its sort of quite hard hitting yes, um, right. uh, social affairs yeah. type stories, yeah, 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 FGM yeah, right. and, you know, rape uh, in relation to um, dates and that kind of thing. Um, so it's that kind of stuff that I was doing for the, maga right. the magazine. So it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, what kind of rouge to wear <laughs> <laughs> of an evening. <laughs> so pro pro proper journalism, but there was something about broadcasting that tickled your fancy more than yeah, print. Yeah, I think, I think because although I'd sort of grown up with Philip Knightley and and you know Harold Evans and yes. and John Pilger with with my paper round. Um, how, how, how did that work? Did you take a paper home or did you just yeah take, yeah I got, I got free copies right? You didn't yeah, take yeah. a very long time to get around the paper because <laughs> <laughs> you kept stopping to no. read the James. No, no, no good no. Just that checking. was not it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, I got free copies at the end right, of the of day. Of course, yeah. So I I'd, I'd take them home and. Um, Devour and, them uh, and de absolutely devour them. Yeah, absolutely I'm devour them. But it was it was Trevor and Alan. They, you know, apart from my father, my formative years, they were the two most influential people in my life. Gosh, um, they were that important to me. Um, so, in in the film of your life, you'd almost be having conversations with imaginary versions of them. You'd be. That's a really good plot point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Guiding Alan. You. What would I do? That's How would it. I report yes. this? How would, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You could do worse, couldn't you, than have those two guiding stars for a oh, career in broadcasting? Man, and, man. And yeah, they were uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. I never got to meet Alan Wicker, but but Trevor, I uh, I uh, account as a, as a friend now, and he's uh, still going strong in his mid eighties. Yeah. Amazing guy. You um you kept the law fires burning uh, mm -hmm. and and secured a pupilage at Middle Temple, which is yeah. quite a big deal. Um, yeah. But your heart yeah. was never in it. No, how did you tell mum and dad? How did you break? How did you break the news? It wasn't easy, actually. It wasn't easy. It, well, it was easier. It was easier knowing that I had something in journalism to go to because I applied to the BBC at the same time. Yeah. So when I got the place at the Middle Temple, um, that was a great thing, and my parents were very happy. Um, but I was holding out, fingers crossed, for the BBC. But actually, it was it was a touch and go thing because mm. I told myself, having already taken a, a year out, which is like the done thing now. Every kid takes a year out, but in those days, not everyone did that actually. Um, so I'd already taken a year out, and um, uh, that was, you know, my parents understood that I needed a year to sort of work out what I wanted to do and how I was going to go about doing it, but. As I said earlier, you don't travel 6,000 miles, you know, to a hostile environment on some occasions for your kids to grow up to be bums. Mm. You know, you want them to be lawyers and accountants or a dentist or something proper, proper yes. job. Um, and so, you know, it was it was tricky breaking the news to them that I wanted to do journalism. Uh, and I know they were disappointed. They were disappointed. Um, 
Uh, less so now, um, although the idea that I'm a quiz show host is also not the reason that they flew 6,000 miles across. You know, to be a quiz show host. <laughs> they don't say that. I mean, definitely. you know, no, they don't say that. But we grew up with Mastermind, and so, and so you know, they they love the idea of that. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was difficult to begin with, I think, and I knew I had to make it work. So you had to move quite quickly. You had to... Prove, yeah. prove to them that you were on a path. Yeah, on a... it's funny. I haven't, I'm, I haven't thought of that, but I think you're right. Subconsciously, I'm thinking, I've, I've got to get on. I've got to get mm. on the telly to mm. make it clear to them that it wasn't. This wasn't just a big old joke, um, or get on the radio or something that was tangible, um, in order to sort of show that um, that it wasn't a big mistake and that you know all the sacrifices that they they'd made to get over to Britain and to create this new life. You know, we're not in we're not in vain. So what, what, what's the gradient like? You start, I think, at, at Radio Bristol. Yeah, I'm at Radio Bristol. I'm on the training course, Radio Bristol. Do that for about 18 months. Which you can't get in Bolton. Which you can't get in Bolton. Which is the days you before digital. You can't yeah, sort of go exactly. through the Sky Channels and exactly. find the low. So yeah. your mum and so, dad so wouldn't have known. They yet. wouldn't have known. Right. They wouldn't have known. But I'm saying, but I'm on the radio. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and uh, and so, you know, they were they were beginning to sort of beginning to forgive me yes. <laughs> as it were um, I'm then of course um, 1989 I'm looking up at the TV in the newsroom and I'm seeing Kate Aidy in Tiananmen Square I'm thinking God that is really what I want to do that exactly. is what Alan Wicker would be doing that's what I want to do and I got an opportunity at Independent Radio News IRN yeah. in London and uh, uh, they said yeah why not? So uh, I had a tryout with them. I interviewed Stevie Wonder, the top of uh, BT Tower. It was his birthday. And uh, coming from local radio, I knew how to sort of mix properly right. and weave sound in and out and whatever. And I, they sent me basically there as a tryout, interview Stevie Wonder, put this thing together. And they liked it, so I got a contract. So I left the BBC. Gosh. Now, trust me, in the late 80s, early 90s, to leave the BBC, they thought I was completely crackers. Yeah, completely well, it's still quite a big crackers. deal now, but it's, then it was completely yeah, then it unheard was, it was of, really. Absolutely unheard What of. were you telling yourself, that I'm going to move I'm, faster? Uh, yeah, or? well, that, that I was going to be able to do national, international stories. Right. Um, and this would be a leg up to what I want to do, which is, you know, travel the world and be a foreign correspondent. So this, um, you, this and it in, worked. This is in the basement on Grays Inn Road, then. This is, it? is so. This or is Gough that. Square. It's still in Gough Square. Square. Still in Gough Square. Because when I started at LBC and and the the IRN legacy was still around, people yeah. people would say with a sense of wonder. Yeah. They'd say something like, "We used to send to a mudslide in yeah. South America," yeah. and I'd say, "What? We don't even send to." party conference no, anymore no, but it really was a so true. powerhouse I mean, you know, the, the Sony I think there were two or three years where IRN won Sony Radio Reporter of the Year bang mm. bang bang it was brilliant it was brilliant it knew its audience um, some of my best friends now are, are, are colleagues that I had at, at IRN. I, I covered the troubles. I was sent to Northern Ireland. Um, you know, Ceausescu's yeah. demise uh, in Romania. Um, you know, the kind of stuff that I would not have got a sniff at at my stage in yes. journalism at the BBC because, you know, there would have been How so many other people ahead of me. So that's why I went to IRN and I was willing to give up the BBC in order in order to do that. And I loved it, absolutely loved it. John Perkins, you remember John Perkins? Yes, I do. Who's pa passed away now. Yeah. Um, you know, he was he was my uh, boss, Vince McGarry. I mean, amazing characters. And, and, John and Greenwood. Proper pedigree. Proper yeah, pedigree, absolutely, proper provenance. Absolutely. I wonder then whether you would have had the confidence to do that if you'd had the... BBC News at 10 on all through your childhood rather than the ITV <laughs> 10 o'clock yeah. news. That's just that, that sense yeah. of it not being the uh, the be all and end you all know, necessarily. Yeah, because I there were no black people on the BBC. No. Trevor was on ITV. Yes. You know, and interestingly, interestingly, Moira John, came a bit later. Moira was a little bit yes. later. Yeah, Moira was a little little bit later. Um sort of mid late 80s. But you can't be what you can't see. And that's that's why Trevor was so important to me. Mm. You know, so so important to me. Um, but uh, but yeah, no. So I, I I went to IRN and I had a fantastic. And, and you filled your boots. I mean, you did the oh, assignments brilliant. that. You, oh yeah, 
you know, big national. St- I mean, you know, the 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 deal, the deal, um, uh, army barracks bombing. Um, you know, I mean, it was it was it was amazing at that age to get a taste of those big international and national stories. What what happened next? What came after that? So so, so hang on. So I've got a sense of what I would call a constructive ambition. Yeah. So it's not I've a worked blind. It out. Yeah. I've, I've there completely, we go. James. I've completely worked it out that I want to get into telly but I don't want to fall flat on my face in London mm. and you know I talk to journalism students now and they say yeah I want to be a presenter I want mm. to be a presenter and I say well actually yeah. uh, just like you and I say well actually I'm just a journalist who happens to do it on the telly yes I mean that's that that's the difference and it, being on the telly cannot be the be all and end all it's part of part of the journey and um, but having said all that you know it was Kate Eddy I saw in Tiananmen Square on the TV and Mm. it was Trevor that I saw and it was Alan Wicker that I saw so and television was the medium through which you know much less so than radio actually through which I saw the rest of the world as a as a kid right you know it wasn't from our own correspondent it wasn't you know um, any of the Radio 4 programs Mm. as such Um, and there wasn't really that much of of an independent current affairs sector um, as a kid growing up on radio so it was TV was the medium. So um, I then realized I was so lucky at IRN, so lucky, because there was this thing called BSB. Oh, yeah. And Square Eels, remember yeah, those? Yeah, just look, Anthony Simmons Gooding set it up. Was the, yeah, was the good fella. yeah, <laughs> and it was... It was it was a rival to Sky, wasn't it? Was it was a rival Potentially, to Sky, yeah. and they were worried. They yes. were worried. And um, uh, Crown Communications, which owned... Um, uh, IRN yeah. they won the franchise to make the news for BSB Okay. Yeah. so one day someone came into the IRN newsroom and said who wants to be on the team who wants to try out for this new thing as a newsreader <laughs> and I'm like yeah I'll give that a go that's serendipity isn't yeah. it that, oh, that is man. A, that's a moment Honestly, that's a absolute moment absolute pure luck yeah, and you know you had an auto cue, but you worked, worked it yourself with a little uh, little thingamajig on the table, a little button thing, and you pressed it, and the auto cue would go up, and that was my first taste of TV, um, actually doing it myself, and um, and it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun, um, and then a job in local TV came up, at back at the BBC, right, so I had. In local TV, right? Yeah. But I'd had experience of covering Northern Ireland and the fall of Ceausescu. I had TV experience, albeit limited in reading the news. Mm. It was a no-brainer for them. Mm. So, you know, they, they had all manner of people applying for this job in local TV in Bristol. I just walked it. I mean, they literally were just like, come on, just just come. We'll give you whatever you like, which was brilliant, which meant that I could learn TV and mess it up if necessary sure. away from London and not tarnish you know, my long-term prospects. And it was great. And anything that I really did learn about television, I learned in Bristol, I learned in the West Country. When, when did mum and dad first see you on screen? So they would have first seen me on screen actually visiting me in the West Country. Right. That's when it would have been. So that would have been the early, uh, early 90s, very early 90s. Yeah, and and throughout this, you you have got your eye on the bigger biggest prizes. I think you 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 know philosophical about it, but in your heart of hearts, you you wanted to be playing at Wembley, so to speak. Um, well, or, or the not. Etihad. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> It didn't exist then, to be fair. It didn't exist then. Okay, Main Road, Main Road. The kid packs at Main Road. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I always wanted to be a foreign correspondent, um, based abroad, learning, absorbing, understanding a different culture, the way that Alan Wicker did, um, or seemingly did, uh, and Trevor did. Um, I wanted to be a foreign mm. correspondent for the BBC. Um, and, uh, and that's what I was sort of working towards um i was in local tv for two fabulous years um and then at some point i sent off a tape to london um and the head of news gathering guy called chris kramer um who's a wonderful man he said yeah we'll give you a tryout 
So I would be doing four shifts in local TV in Bristol and then, and then driving up on the Friday, doing the Saturday and the Sunday, um, and then driving back Sunday, no, driving back on the Monday to do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Crikey. Yeah. Um, I did that for I did that for about four or five months. I was knackered. I bet you were. But, but it worked. But well, and also, you, you, you know exactly what you're driving towards, don't you? Yeah, you know exactly, exactly what you're aiming for. Long and it worked term, because yeah. in 1996, you got the posting to Tokyo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was which was brilliant. I'd I'd done um, a number of foreign uh, trips, mm. Kosovo, um, Algeria, um, Angola, Namibia. Um, I'd done various stories abroad for the Today program um, under uh, Roger Mosey, who was mm. the news editor, uh, who was the uh, editor of the program, and he was just brilliant at, at, at saying, you know, got any ideas? great go off and do it and that's what I did so I got that sort of foreign reporting experience although I wasn't living abroad so I was traveling a lot and uh, and then one day um, the editor of TV news because the two editors were separate then you had an editor of foreign um, news in radio and an editor of foreign news in TV and the editor of foreign news in TV he said you know that story you did in Algeria for the today why don't you do it for us hmm. I said well I just didn't I didn't think about it I said well next idea you get do it for us so I came up with an idea off my own bat to cover um, the aftermath of the war in Liberia and I went with a cameraman and um, that was my first taste of international TV reporting for BBC Network News and I absolutely loved it loved it uh, and all of that sort of almost accidental apprenticeship was perfectly placed I mean you, you, you mm. you'd got you'd got all your yeah, experience it, in place, so yeah. there was no sense of a leap into the unknown for you, really. No, actually, no. You're right. You're right. There, there wasn't. It was, it was, it was so meticulously planned, mm. but a little bit like Man City over the last five, six years when it comes to the Champions League. You can plan and plan and plan, but if you haven't got that bit of luck, <laughs> and trust me, James, we had that luck against Inter Milan <laughs> yes, because you did. they should have they should have beaten us, <laughs> but they missed. But the the rub of the green was with us, yeah. and you know, no matter how well you plan, if you haven't got the rub of the green, and I think I. You know, I had that my first um, my first shift in network news, nineteen ninety two. I remember it. It was um, I walked into the walked into the newsroom. David Loin, brilliant correspondent, was sitting there, and Justin Webb. They were they were in the pool. Yeah, the pool, the taxi rank of reporters. That was the quality, and um, I think it was the Barcelona Olympics or something. And um, I think the two of them thought it was beneath them to do that, to do a report on the Barcelona Olympics. Um, uh, no offense, Justin or David, um, but <laughs> it I, wasn't news news. Yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't it news was, news yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't yeah, yeah. news news. So I ended up doing it, and I it was it was quite high up in the bulletin, and you know uh, I didn't make a mess of it, and they kept asking me back weekend after weekend after weekend, which was great. Then they gave me a contract. And 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 then you sort of really start motoring, don't you? Over a hundred countries: uh, mm. the, the Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ukraine, mm. and and some horrible stuff as well. Mass shootings in America. Um, yeah. And and also we're moving now into the bit where you are becoming a public figure, where you're becoming known. It's a slow process, though. Mm. Are, are there milestones in it? Are there are there moments? where you felt that's crikey that's a gear i didn't know existed that i've just reached yeah i mean you know your 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 first one's first um big natural disaster mm. one's first conflict one's first war you know um where you're potentially in 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 harm's way um you know the first time that the first time that you do a live which is a big deal. Mm. Um, the first time you go abroad with a camera crew because it's a lot of money and they're putting so much faith in you not to... I mean, you know, the lightweight cameras and, you know, feeding um, through the ether online and stuff down computers, none of that existed. No, it was satellite dishes and, and you know, huge operations plugging into local TV stations in some backwoods around the world somewhere to get... I mean, it was, it was a big big deal to be you know entrusted with with gathering um the elements of a story from abroad um so all of those first were 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 important to me 
and um, and yet it was everything you dreamed it would be, wasn't it? I think. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was. Sense of adventure. Um, you know, finding out about different peoples and, as I say, food and culture and art and and music and and just and just being on planes the whole time. I mean, I loved airplane food. It didn't bother me. It really didn't bother me because I was going to another amazing well, that's what, destination. That's, though, it's on the, the taste way. of adventure, isn't it? Yeah. It's not the taste of rehydrated potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can be. Yeah, of course, right, a bit of both. Yeah, a bit of both. Taste of rehydrated exactly. potatoes. The aftertaste <laughs> of rehydrated potatoes. But you know, being in sort of you know, and and a lot of this, um, me starting off in this way, was pre nine eleven. Yes, of course. So you know, particularly living in America, it was like getting on a plane. It was like getting on a bus. Mm. I mean, it literally was. You know, they'd be waiting for you. I'd be half the time. I'd be late getting to to LAX when I was based in Los Angeles and they'd just be waiting for you said right yeah okay he's finally come on you know it would be it would be like like getting getting a bus it was so every day um and that made the whole process of traveling a lot um uh, right, yeah. easy it yeah, was easy it was it was conducive to fitting in with this life of a roving correspondent that that wasn't particularly hard logistically for me to to do um, and and I, I want to move now to some of the themes that you explore in Everything Is Everything, which is which is much more than a sort of chronological biogra- autobiography, isn't it? Because yeah, you, you pull together the the things that made your family and the and the things the things that made you. Um, I, there's one element that took me by surprise. I can't remember whether this is in the book or whether I've read it somewhere else. Given what you've just said about Trevor McDonald, mm. how surprised you were when George Alagaya took you to one side to yeah. reflect on what a big deal it was that you had got as a as a as a black mm. man you had got the mastermind job. Yeah, yes, because I suppose I hadn't realized what a big deal it was. No. You know, it it's it's it was a program that was doing pretty well. You know, million and a third million uh, and three quarters to two, sometimes over two million people. Huge audiences these days on on terrestrial television. Um, and I sort of, I should have realized, but I sort of didn't. And it wasn't until I actually got the job, it was announced and the public scrutiny and the Mm. media scrutiny that I realized this is, this is absolutely huge. Um, not just because it's a televisual institution and it's, it's next to university challenge. It's the longest Mm. running quiz show, uh, in Britain doesn't quite compete with Wheel of Fortune in the States in terms of longevity, but it's, you know, 50 odd years, 50 years. Um, but also the fact that on British terrestrial TV, there've only been two presenters. Mm, it's mad though, isn't it? Which, when you think about it, it's just like, my Lord. And I'm the third. Yeah. It's it's just and I'm still young enough to give it a proper shift. It was still yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, um, Magnus and and John and all that somehow hadn't sunk in until George. Okay. Yeah, it's it's quite weird. Um, until George took me to one side and said, "Look, you know, this is this is such a big, big thing. Um, you know, savor it, enjoy it, and and you know, it's it's absolutely wonderful." And and for George to do that, who was such a magnanimous, mm. brilliant man, I mean, he'd achieved everything uh, in his profession. He was at the peak of his powers, um, and he always had time for us younger ones. Um, you know, there's a moment when when the two of us are in the newsroom and we look around and I, I, there was some, something, maybe it was after George Floyd or something, I can't remember, and we just thought, you know, we need to do something about this case. Yeah. It's just me and you. Hmm. What the hell's going on? This Michelle wasn't on shift, Rita wasn't on shift, <laughs> so it was just me and him. Right. Uh, and it was at that point that the four of us got together and said, look, we need to lobby to get more producers of people of color into, into the news. And so we had lots of chats with Tony Hall, tried to get things moving, and we were doing the same with, with Tim, and George was instrumental in that, so absolutely th- instrumental. Th- th- there's, a, there's a story, isn't there, of you showing a Jamaican journalist around yeah, broadcasting house yeah. and him noticing you were the My only person God. of colour there and you not even having clocked it no, anymore no I, I'm just, just so used to it but for him coming from the Caribbean and um, uh, seeing me in this newsroom with no one else and this was the newsroom at the London Olympics yeah. so slightly artificial that was it, yeah. but, but essentially it was you know full of full of uh, news people and sports people uh, and I was the only person of color. And he, he just turned to me and he said, how do you cope? 
how do you cope? And he meant that genuinely. He wasn't he wasn't being you know funny or anything. How do you cope? I said, well, it's not you know it, it hasn't been a problem for me, and it it, it isn't a problem for me. Um, but we do need better representation, no question. When we when you talk about the book becoming a love letter to the Windrush generation in in the course of writing it, how how much of that is down to Peter, your brother? Um, that's P- Peter's Peter's experience. Um, my older brother who died of prostate cancer a few years ago. Um, well, who, while waiting for a pop, yeah, I mean, yeah, he caught was, right in the Windrush pincers. Yeah, yeah, he was he was uh, he was one of those um, people who were part of the empire, who were told they were citizens as a result of the Forty Eight Nationality Act, who because he was a child didn't have his own passport so he came uh, on uh, on my parents passport and uh, never got his own passport um, and then around about 2015 16 was told well you need to start you need to produce um, proof that you have a legal right to be here having been in the country for well over 40 years and that was an experience that my older brother Lionel went through and so many hundreds of thousands of people from the Windrush generation had to go through. And they had to produce some evidence for every single year that they'd been in the country to show that they had the right to be in the country. If you're a kid and you've been here for however long, um, what evidence is there going to be? School records, a landing slip maybe, mm. that might be there. Mm. But guess what? The Labour government, um, uh, just before, I think it was 20, 2009, 2010, they destroyed all the landing, ter- landing cards. So that proof isn't there. So you're trying to find bank statements, you're trying to find proof you're at school. Mm. And it was my brother Lionel who rang me up um, agitated phone call saying, look, have you got anything, anything that might help prove that I got to this country before 1971 when the immigration rules changed? And uh, I didn't have anything. What was I going to have? Mum didn't have anything. We didn't have anything. Um, because you had to have proof for every single year. And eventually, there was a photograph he found in the Bolton Evening News of him in the school choir Wow. taken by a press photographer and that was proof that he went to Cannon Slade School absolutely astonishing it's brutal though isn't it how, how do so you brutal. square these experiences with the requirements for, for, for political impartiality how do you how do you resist the urge to hit politicians over the head with some of the stuff that's happened <laughs> to, to your family it's it's it's, it's when I am in the offices of the BBC I'm in the newsroom I'm on the air and that airtime is owned by the BBC. It is so easy. Yeah, I sense that. Because it's my job. Yes. It's my job. And you've had um, from the start a very, very clear concept of exactly what the job is. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe in that job, particularly in an environment, um, a media landscape that is fractured where so many people can get their news from so many other sources and a lot of them are crap. Yeah. yeah. Online. <laughs> yeah social media, whatever. And that that emphasis on impartiality is even more important now, I feel, yes, of course. for an organisation like the BBC. So, you know, as soon as I walk through, I mean, I vote, of course, in elections. Yeah. I have views on the left, the right, the middle, the far left, the far right. I am as opinionated as... As you are. <laughs> well, let's not get carried away. <laughs> Trust me on that. I do, I do. Trust me on course, that. But course. you know what? When I walk through the doors of the BBC, no one should know. Yeah. No one should know. And and But that doesn't mean you can't be on the right, on, on the side of justice, fairness, um, equality, history, when it comes to certain issues. No question. And what most people would consider to be fair and right and proper, I don't see any problem in espousing that. Mm. Um, It's how you do it. It's got to be evidence-based. It's got to be based in fact. I wrote an article for The Guardian this week Mm. on migration. Now, migration BBC newsreader, put those two together. That is not what you'd normally put together. But you know what? I put it together based on facts, evidence, 
gave it to the bosses. They read it, said absolutely no problem. Yeah. No problem. And it ended up in The Guardian. Now, there are people out there who might think I was a big old lefty because he's writing in The Guardian, but I've written for The Sun, I've written for The Times, I've written for The Telegraph. You know, I think it is possible to get across a point of view if that point of view is based on evidence. If it is just opinion off the top of your head, anyone can have an opinion, mm. and that's fine. But should it fill up the airwaves? Should it, should it, should it be um, a part of what the BBC is about, particularly a, a, an organization that's funded by a license fee? that everyone has to pay, whether you're on the right, whether you're in the middle, whether you're, you know, some socialist or some, yes. some right wing, whatever. No. no. It's proof. It's proof of an opinion, isn't it, that you're describing? It's the, the, the evidence is, is the bricks with which you if built it. Yeah, if it's fact, is it opinion? It's just fact. Yes, yeah, true. Although that's a blurred line. It is. Days, it, but that's why it, the look, BBC it's, remains it's so valuable. It's, of course it's, it is. It's, it's do you really worry for the corporation a bit? Do you do you, do you have I, I I I worry for the license fee. Yes. Um definitely. I you know, in 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 an air in an era when you can get your news from anywhere, you know, why should you why should you mm. be forced if you have a television to 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 pay a license, you've I just, mean, I totally get that. You just provided a fairly compelling answer to that question. It's just well, it's just, I, well, we've we've got to keep battling. Yes, we've we've got to get across, and I, you know, we are trying to to get across this idea that that you know what you see on the BBC is based on verifiable facts that most people, reasonable pe people, will understand as. Um, constituting some idea of the truth. So it's likely that if the BBC does say two plus two, it probably equals four. Yeah. Um, night probably does follow day. <laughs> but whether or not truth, whether or not it's the truth, I'm not sure. Okay. I always talk about facts yes, and not course. truth. Yes, yeah. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it even more than I did before we sat down. Um, <laughs> a memoir of love, hate and hope, everything is everything by Clive Myrie is, is out now. Pretty much yeah, by yeah. the time this yeah, goes out, it yeah, is. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, um, September the fourteenth. We haven't touched on your Italian adventures, which are utterly delightful. Oh, uh, it was a laugh. It's a good uh, laugh. And of course, we've we've mentioned my Mastermind briefly, although we haven't mentioned my astonishing performance on the program. <laughs> do you do you have any ambitions left? What ambitions? Oh, do you? yeah. Of course to, you do. What yeah, ambitions do you to, have to, left? To keep telling stories. To keep telling stories. The world changes. People's ideas of what's right and wrong changes. Society changes. It's a very different world from the one. The stories that were being told in the fifties, very when I was watching, uh, when Alan Wicker was operating, and when I was seeing him in the sixties and seventies, and and Trevor in the seventies. You know, the, the ideas, concepts, thoughts. There's always something new. There's always something fresh. Um, and you know, it's it's keeping that constant sense of 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 wonder. Yeah and curiosity i think uh and i get it even now through through mastermind you know some of the subjects that are chosen i'm sitting there and i'm thinking wow that's amazing that 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 is what you're focused on that's what you're studying i it's 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 brilliant and i you know i even learned some things from your round <laughs> <me> something. <laughs> i learned a lot from your round you're Club. brilliant Clive you look very nervous, though. I, I have to absolutely say, absolutely yeah, cracking it, mate. Yeah. Seriously, but everyone is, yeah. right? I was particularly oh, man. nervous. I think even I more so you, than others. Everybody, it's it's just, and I even now, it's my third series, yeah. and even now, when that music pipes up in in the sort of you know the blackness of that studio, See. your heart just goes. Ooh. <laughs> Stop it! It's like <laughs> getting flashbacks. I'm taking you back, <laughs> Clive Murray. Thank you. Oh, pleasure, James. Thank you so much. Thank you. 